welcome to Chatter. I'm Benjamin Wittes, Lawfare's Editor-in-Chief. This week, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Alicia Wanless, on disinformation and how little we understand what it is. I don't think the U.S. could possibly regulate anything related to disinformation, nor do I think it probably should at this point, given our lack of understanding. But that means that we're also incapable of doing anything about it. There's always going to be a level of information pollution. It's just a byproduct of humanity, right? The question is, what are the levers for actually doing something about it? If we don't see the information environment for what it is, we can never be strategic in it. We will always just be reacting. So I want to start, before we get to the article that you wrote, I want to start with the question of the field that you're critiquing, which is the field that has blossomed since 2016 really, the field of uh, fretting about disinformation. And you have a broader critique of this field, which is that it's never paused to define its own parameters or its own terms. Uh, So let's let's start there and start with, uh, you know, everybody agrees that disinformation is a problem. why are you being grumpy about that as a premise? Well, I, I think to start, there actually is no field to speak of. Um, that's part of the problem is that disinformation is a singular problem in a wider space that is the information environment. And most of the researchers looking not just at disinformation but at, of aspects of the information environment are all coming from different disciplines – Um, So they're coming from different fields. They all have their own terminology and methods for how they approach this topic. And we lack consilience, like we lack a shared kind of language and understanding between them. Um, So I think the bigger critique is that we lack a field where we really need one. And that should go beyond a singular threat type. All right. So I want to hold that whole idea that there isn't a field where there should be one. There is... However, a almost universal acknowledgement that there's a problem, right? The platforms are busily regulating uh, or or as they call it, moderating material that is maliciously untrue or intentionally untrue of one sort or another. Uh, The former president routinely calls the news media the fake news The news media is busy running fact checks of things that it regards as untrue. Everybody seems to accept that there is a problem of intentional misinformation or misinforming of people. Why is that not adequate to define the study of that stuff and figuring out what to do about it, who's right, who's wrong, what policies can help what policies don't help? Why is that not enough to define a field? I don't think it's enough to define a field because it's not actually explaining anything more than that singular phenomenon. Like, great, we've got many examples of information pollution and types of information and and activities that we don't like, right? So politicians lying to get into power or media outlets who sell opinion to get viewers and inflame people towards a certain direction or people who just like make money off of this stuff. Um, But that's just telling us that there's a problem over and over and over again. It doesn't tell us what it actually means in the context of the information environment. We don't really have a great understanding for the impact of something like disinformation on audiences Um, In terms of measurements, we're lacking these things. Um, We also don't really understand what happens when different types of content moderation are undertaken by companies, like what happens on other platforms, what happens in the media, what happens to the audiences. Do we really understand the things that we're doing in this space? Um, But that's like a lack of measurements. That comes back to the research problem in that we have lots of people doing 
case studies. We've got lots of separate studies looking at a small sliver like fact checking, but we don't really have a systematized way of understanding the space as a whole. Why does that matter? Because it means that we don't know what a baseline is in an information ecosystem before a disturbance like information pollution happens. So we don't know really how that disturbance is changing things, whether there's a natural kind of resilience that people just don't believe it or they shun it or they get over it. We have no idea because we don't look at it longer term and we don't look at it in that kind of systemic view. Um, which also means that we don't know about the aftermath. We don't know how much an ecosystem rebounds. We're just lacking all of that. All right. So you have now referred at least four separate times to terms borrowed from the world of ecology. You've described an information ecosystem. You've described information pollution. You've described sort of the natural resilience of an ecosystem all of which uh, uh, sounds like you are talking about environmentalism. It is, I don't think, an accident because you wrote a, a, a long uh, dissertation about ecology as a sort of a model for thinking about the information space. Uh, this idea of information ecology and specifically this idea that we should think of information spaces as ecosystems. Uh, where does this idea come from? Who thought it up? And to what extent is it uh, meant as a, a loose metaphor? And to what extent is it meant as a, a more precise guidance metaphor? Uh, as in, should we should we have an environmental protection? I mean, you're Canadian, so I don't Ministry of the Environment for for information uh, or an environmental protection agency for for information, or do you mean it in a more uh, uh, in a more gentle sense? I mean it in that I think that we can borrow methods and approaches that have been applied to studying the physical environment, which is a complex system. Um, to studying the information environment. Uh, I think that there are many comparisons that are similar. Like, I mean, we are humans. We're here. We're part of the physical world. We're part of the information environment. We shape it. It shapes us. Um, there are myriad ways in which people get information and process information, different channels that they get it through from one to one to like mailing something to more complex technology into AI. Um, and so all of this works like a complex system, right? We have these interactions and processes between us. Um, we exist as a species in it. Um, machines are also starting to come up and really play a part in terms of processing information and starting to shape uh, the space as well and our understanding of it. Um, so to me, looking to ways other systems are studied and seeing if this can be applied to this messy space called the information environment is to me the one way forward in which maybe we get to a systematized approach. Maybe we can have consilience in which we draw on other fields, much like ecology, which studies the physical environment, has done for the physical world. But they've got like hundreds of years of an, on us in terms of systematizing what they could observe and measuring that and coming up with, with processes. But I think that I think that there are direct comparisons, right? Like we have disturbances in the information environment. We have information floods, right? Where a single idea gets pushed out by one side to try to flood that information environment so that people all buy that idea. We have different forms of information pollution from things like spam to infotainment crap to all the way to deliberate lies to try to push people in certain directions. Um, I think that there is ways, there are ways to study the ecosystem such that we can measure conditions and whether they fluctuate or not. And if we can get to that kind of systemic understanding, perhaps there's a possibility, one, for us to understand how disturbances change an ecosystem and what happens afterwards. But it also provides us with a way to study these things that goes beyond case studies or narrow examples of things we don't like, which often are parts of information competition. And the issue here is that when it's part of an information competition, the likelihood that it's going to be politicized and one side or one community is going to really resist you doing anything about it is extremely strong. So right now we're sitting in a period where I don't think the U.S. could possibly regulate anything related to disinformation, nor do I think it probably should at this point, given our lack of understanding. But that means that we're also incapable of doing anything about it, right? 
Right. Although actors within the system that are not government actors are capable of doing something. Yeah, they are. And they're doing it on both sides. I mean, I would say we're probably in the midst of a heightened information competition that is bordering towards conflict, that we're on a path towards what I've seen in five case studies throughout time that leads to physical violence. Um, and I'm not sure that that we can come back from it at this point. That's my biggest fear. All right. So this is maybe the question I should have started with. But who the heck are you in this conversation? So on the one hand, you're a fellow at Carnegie um, and you're, you know, an important voice in this conversation. And on the other hand, uh, you, you have a, a kind of an odd background from the point of view of the people who are, you know, doing content moderation or doing the, the disinformation policy environment, which is composed of people who got worried after 2016 about Russian interference in the election. It's composed of people who come out of the content moderation space or who hate right-wing media. You come to this from a very different place in the conversation. How did you get into this whole field insofar as it is a field at all, which, of course, you argue that it isn't? I would like it to be. That would be yeah, great. You want to push it to being a field. But you're, you're, you're kind of framing yourself as an outsider to the conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm curious how you got into it. I think this stems from things that I've just generally been fascinated about in terms of humans and human behavior and how they end up in places that have massive consequences for society. So underlying it, I, I was fascinated with wars. And that's my PhD is in war studies. Um, I really, as a kid, just was fascinated by the First and Second World Wars. How do they happen? How do people get swept up in them? How do they end up laying their life down for different systems? Um, how do they end up doing really awful things to each other? And so that led to an interest in things like propaganda and language engineering and, and intelligence and how these things are used um, to try to manipulate uh, governments and people into doing things. And I, I will say I have seen the inside of Alicia's house and it has – Alicia has an uncommonly interesting collection of propaganda from around the world. I, I try, much to my husband's chagrin. Um, there's, a, there's a moratorium on that. I'm not allowed to buy anymore. <laughs> I even saw Swedish propaganda. That was really hard to find. A friend, a friend in the Swedish military really helped me uh, try to find whatever I've got there. Um, so that's what I was interested in. I came to this from this lens of more like propaganda. Um, I come from, as you like to say, this is my my rube shtick. Is that what you? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's Alicia's rube shtick. Here it is, people. <laughs> I grew up on a farm in the middle of Ontario in nowhere. And um, now I sound really Canadian, I'm sure. Uh and I ended up majoring in Russian. Um, and this is at a time, because I'm old, uh, when Russia was really falling down. Like, this is the darkest of dark days. I was... See, I'm old. When I st Even older, when I studied Russia, R Russian, Russia was like a great... Uh, the Soviet Union was a great power still. <laughs> yeah, it was really down and out by the time <laughs> I was doing it. And there was um, w uh, one other guy and, and me were the first majors in seven years. I was the only one to graduate in my year when I did. And... I mean, it was sometimes a struggle just to have a prof to graduate on time because the program was decimated. Anyway, I obviously could not find work and took whatever jobs I could get um, in the 2000s, uh, which led to a patchwork of career, which is, I don't think, really relevant. But suffice it to say that it gave me experience in um, understanding how the Internet works and access to it and all of those fun things. Um, and an introduction into, like, policy. Um, eventually, I ended up wanting to do more research and writing. And at that point, I had got a job at a think tank, uh, a nonprofit in, in Ottawa um, that had operations all over the world. And I was their director of strategic communications because that's how you apply a Russian degree with a fixation on propaganda, alas. Um, although we were promoting things like 
digital safety practices in Syria. So ethically, it was things I could get behind. But at the same time, I started a blog, um, which is named La Generalista because a friend of mine had told me, you just have to accept that you're a generalist and own it. And so that was me owning it. And I just started exploring more about how propaganda was changing in a digital age was where it started. And then that work led me to end up working with almost every key stakeholder on the influence problem um, from like trying to work with militaries to get them to understand what the information environment meant, not in some keech kind of way in which you just add on fake social media and call it a day, but really trying to dig deeper to understand that every action they have has a reaction in the information environment that adversaries can use. And also that pushed me to start thinking through some of the ethical concerns for democracies, like principles that we're currently lacking that should be covered across um, government, including military. Um, I ended up working with tech company. Um, I trained media on monitoring and um, and uh, what's the word, verifying uh, user-generated content. I obviously was in academia because I went back to go do a PhD around this time. Um, but what happened was the more I dug into different fields um, when I was looking at it from the strategic communications lens, like whether it's behavioral economics or like just trying to understand what works or researching propaganda, what I found really wanting was that Everything just felt mostly like a case study. Like you can just somehow walk into the information environment and change it, make it happen. And and so there was a lack of explanation of what the information environment meant as a system. And that's what drove me to do the PhD. Yeah. So I want to, I want to, I first met you, it's several years ago now, but it was at a conference, the location of which shall remain nameless. And uh, you, uh, gave a lot of this, laid a lot of this thesis out um, in response to a whole lot of people talking in ways that were, I think it's fair to say, f- very reflective of the kind of case study mentality. Well, I saw this happen and I was working at Facebook or Twitter and therefore blank. Um, and I got to say, you got a lot of blank stares and the um, there were a lot of people present who um, reacted. I want to say, I mean, I was was entranced by the argument, um, but I think a lot of people were, you know, just wanted to. Okay, now she's done and we can go on with exactly the same conversation we were having before she started that that was very interesting, but it's disruptive and let's, you know, be polite people at a at a garden party. I'm curious whether you think your way of thinking about this subject is catching on or whether you uh, feel like a skunk at a garden party. Well, that's a complicated question, Ben, because, I mean, I'm an introvert, so I don't think it matters whether my ideas are taken up or not. I'm always going to feel like the outsider at any social <laughs> gathering. That's just a fact. <laughs> um, so that I don't know if I... Extrinsic <laughs> variables yeah, there. I don't know if I have an objective way to measure that. And and I would also add that every talk I give, I, I think sucks. So... Um, I, I don't know. To be clear, I thought the talk was spectacular. I just think it was like like people – a lot of people who were using the phrase information environment and information ecosystem weren't thinking in those terms then and it landed differently then than it would today. Yeah. Well, I mean I would say I kind of came back to doing more research on this in 2014 um, and – I would say using the word information environment back then, there was literally only one audience that had any kind of grasp of that and was using it regularly, and that was militaries. Um, And since then, I would say that there's a lot more use of the term. I think that there is a growing awareness that there is this system that needs to be studied. I think that the terminology is still very unclear, and I know I'm being extremely pedantic when I want to separate something like information ecology, which is the study of the information environment from the information environment, which is like everything the world over in terms of where we process and share information, from information ecosystems, which are like a smaller component within the information environment. Um, But I think that the conflation of terms is more a signal that 
We just don't have clarity of these definitions and concepts yet. Did you coin these terms? Did somebody else coin them or did they kind of, there's a group of people who've been thinking about this at around the same time and the terms kind of evolved out of uh, the writing that a bunch of people were doing. Do, Do these ideas have specific human generation or are they more sort of spiritus mundi kind of things? Uh, you have pockets of it popping up in different places. So I think um, some of the earlier terms that were used, there was information environment in the 70s from this wonky book that I'm not going to be able to remember off the top of my head. Um, And also there was another one called information ecology. I think the problem with many of those books was that they used the words, but then they didn't actually dig into it and offer anything more. So it was just like borrowing a term without exploring what it could actually mean in depth. Um, And then really you start to get more discussion around the information environment, um, 2000s, and in particular there was a joint publication from the uh, U.S. military, um, JP13, I want to say, that is on influence operations. And they really dug into the concept of the information environment there. And then later on there was another NATO working group that – really put out a longer form paper on what the information environment means. But it was really contained, I would say, more to a subset of military thinking about it. Um, And also, I think, trying to posit it as another domain, like land, air, and cyber. I disagree with that as a as a concept. I think it's and 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 let's let's pause on that. Mm-hmm. Why? I mean, it's a it's a superficially attractive idea that you can fight in the seas, you can fight in the air, you can fight in space. We have space force now, and we're going to beat them up in space. And you've got great Netflix show. You've got <laughs> you've got cyber. Um, why not information space? I actually don't think that those domains really exist in in the old world. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, let's look at Marines. What are they then? They, they, They're a cross domain. Right, well, I, no, I it, think the whole domain idea is just a neat and tidy way to try to have mandates. Oh, you want a soapbox? How we're working just across mandates and silos, completely disconnected across the information environment, and then think that we're going to have strategy. <laughs> right, but there there are some... I mean, if you're going to fight on water, you need ships, right? I mean, I I don't think there's, you know, iron walls separating the domains. But there are, you know, you complain that this area doesn't have a discipline. It doesn't have, uh, you know, terms that define it. Well, you know, ships, you know, airplanes, right? These are different disciplines. They... They occupy and fight in different physical locations and different types of physical locations. It's it's a loose rubric. Why not information? Because the information environment transcends all of those domains. It applies across all of them. So it's not separate in any kind of way. It's part and parcel of where we live all the time and function and operate. But isn't that true of cyber too? I would say that cyber is the underlying infrastructure of a component of the information environment. And so, yes, it spans geographies. Um, And now with wireless satellite, it does span across the water and can be virtually everywhere. But um, to my mind, the cyber side is really an underlying infrastructure that's part and parcel with the information environment. And this is also a problem in this kind of like siloed approach that we take everything. The people who are over here working in cyber think that they are just something separate that is disconnected from information. That information is just like, another layer that doesn't have any relevance to them, but they're really deeply interconnected. Yeah, it also seems to me that one of the one of the differences is is that you can attack somebody else's ships, you can attack somebody else's airplanes or use your airplanes to attack, you can attack somebody else's computers. You can't really attack somebody's information in a in a physical sense, right? It, it, it's ultimately a metaphor and a domain, at least as the military thinks about them, aren't, you know, land warfare is not a metaphor. Land warfare is, you know, a thing that happens and, you know, that human beings do. And I, I think one of the reasons it doesn't work as a domain is that it's a little bit too metaphorical. Well, and I think you're hitting the nail on the head in terms of the way that so much of this is framed in the context of defense and conflict that it it 
is a slippery slope into being really problematic for democracies. Um, so what I mean by that is like recently we were looking at looking at emergency management frameworks to see whether this could be applied to understanding like the sum total of, of intervention options that let's say a democratic society has in the context of a conflict within the information environment. And what stood out was that, okay, you could borrow from like fires and stuff like that. That seemed to, to work in the context of dealing with humans and trying to get them to go along with you and protecting their safety and trying to engage them and all of that. And like, how do you do the cleanup afterwards? Um, another option that we looked at was you could look at cyber emergency responses, but the language around it was a little bit disturbing in the context of thinking about humans and democracy. And that was like, identify the threat eliminate the threat. And it had all of these connotations of destruction, right? Like destruction and protection. And that makes sense if you're like fighting a physical war. But if you're trying to win hearts and minds, you're trying to ensure that people actually want to consume information that is accurate and reliable as opposed to it landing short because they've already come to believe something that doesn't make sense. You can't really talk about Elimination. Especially not in a society that believes in free speech, right? I mean, you look at a purveyor of disinformation, however you want to define it, a purveyor of misinformation and lies, and you would seldom think of dealing with that by eliminating it with an M1 tank or something, right? Right. Um, here is my reservation about your your theory, and I'm going to lay it out in much more florid terms than I actually feel it for purposes of, of conversation. But it seems to me what you're saying is you got to understand the whole system as a system. And if I'm trying to prevent foreign interference in the next election, that seems like a hopeless a hopeless intellectual task before I get to do anything. And, uh, and I hear a thousand voices crying, but Alicia, we have to do something. And you saying, yeah, but do you understand what this intervention to prevent this pollution, what the spinoff effects are going to be? And my question is, why isn't your very laudable intellectual con caution about interfering in, in an ecosystem or in an the larger information environment, why doesn't it amount to a constant counsel of despair and doing nothing? You mean personally? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, not that you control the information <laughs> space, but I mean as a policy matter that if, if we, you know, you have – you put a bill in front of Congress that would, you know, do something and you send Alicia Wanless up to testify and she says we really have to understand the system and how the inputs interact and what they're all going to do. And here, do you know the answer to these questions with the bill? And of course the answer is no. It just seems like a good idea if you're Senator Warner or – you know, Senator, anybody who's proposed such a bill. Um, and it seems like good, healthy, democratic stuff. And here's Alicia Wanless telling you you don't know enough about the system to regulate it. And in your heart, you may know she's right. But in your gut, you feel like you need to do something before some foreign government, you know, screws up our elections again. And so – like, what's the what's the balance in your understanding of this? You're, you're proposing that we understand very deeply a system of almost infinite complexity. And when when do we get to, you know, do something? <laughs> um, the bane of every policymaker everywhere. Um, I think there are things that could and should be done in the short term that – would be very satisfying to get to an answer faster that are not being done. Like what? Uh, well, operational reporting of online services. So for transparency purposes, like having some sort of a framework to go through how they operate, like who are the user bases in a specific information ecosystem? Um, 
what are the policies that they're making? Who's deciding that? How are they being implemented? What kind of research are they doing? I mean, there's about eight or so categories um, that that could be dug into that if enough democracies said, hey, online services, we want you to report on these things, it would be really hard to ignore. Um, and that, in turn, would tell us a lot more about how they function, um, but also then it would help researchers understand what kind of data would even be available to study because that's a big gaping hole. I think that there is a lot to be done in terms of data access for research purposes. And so there are great people like Rebecca Trumbull who are working on that now for the DSA. That's low-hanging fruit for a lot of other democracies to like jump on and do a similar approach. Um, I think the problem here is that we're never going to get to an, a systemic understanding of the information environment as we need to to make informed decisions unless massive investments are made. And I don't see any single country being able to do that. I mean, the U.S. has the money for it, but I'm sorry, many of the democracies are backsliding. And that's a really scary proposition that any single country would be able to potentially co-opt something like that. Um, so I think that there's there's work to be had for maybe the G7, OECD to come together to really scale up research, research across the board. Um, I think in reaction to the we must do something, I think there's, I mean, you've heard that before. I hear it right? all the time. I hear it all the time. Um, and I, I understand the pain and the need. Uh, that's why I said like these three things are things that could move the dial massively over a longer term. And yes, it's not satisfying now. Um, but what I'm concerned about is that correlation is not causation. And so just because a foreign government was putting shit on Facebook and doing leaks and hacks – Hacks and leaks. That I would like that fixed. <laughs> yeah, that, that, the hacking and dumping part doesn't seem like an information. It's only at the back end of it is an information ecology issue. But the the thing is, like, just because, and we'll say it, Russia was messing around doesn't mean that that changed the election more than anything else, right? There is a really good book called Network Propaganda by uh, Ben Glare, Roberts, and Ferris uh, on the 2016 election. And I would hazard to guess that media coverage – had as much uh, influence and the choices that media outlets in the U.S. made in terms of their coverage. Now, yes, that means a whole lot of coverage on the Goose for 2.0 le leaks and hack and leak um, of, of what happened may have been the thing that's pushed people over the edge, but it wouldn't have pushed people over the edge if it wasn't being constantly given to them over and over again. Um, now, then you have this other issue of like, so when should that kind of information be surfaced? Because obviously people should be informed. But I think that there's a lot that we need to reconsider in the context of elections and election cycles. Um, we tend to really only see problems regarding the information environment in four separate, very disconnected ways, one of them being events like elections, the other being like specific threats like disinformation or violent extremism or whatever the topic du jour in the media is. Another one is threat actors and whoever we're fixated on. Um, and the fourth one is new technology. Right. So we just shift every time. So sometimes it was Twitter because they gave more access or they made really bad decisions. Um, and now it's AI. And we just keep lurching from singular topic to singular topic and missing that wider space. And the reason why I think it's so important comes back to strategy. That's about being able to make the best decisions from an array of options and really understanding your overall operating environment. If we don't see the information environment for what it is, we can never be strategic in it. We will always just be reacting. So in your dissertation, you have four or five case studies of your own which are historical in, in nature and all deal with uh, information environments disrupted in some way in fashions that affected conflicts or, or internal politics of, of countries. Um, talk about your case studies and why you chose them. This feels like a defense. Um. <laughs> um, no, because at the end of the day, there is uh, there is only passing on chatter. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I thought I did this already. Um, so one thing for building a theory is that it can't just be stuck in a single space and time, right? So if I was only looking at what happened in the last 25 years or recent events, then what I may come up with may not be something that can endure. Um, so it only made sense to go back to the beginning. And I took um, I took a case study from each major media epic. 
Uh, so from the age of rurality, um, with the alphabet just coming in um, to the printing press and then in between with the steam engine and then the age of electricity, um, especially with radio and television coming in and then the digital age. Um, and I was in more studies, so it was chosen around conflicts, but looking at the 25-year period or so before the conflict and what happened and what kind of shifts were there, were there patterns essentially um, in the in criteria that changed in that time period and what kind of disturbances followed that. So if we had the introduction of new technology, um, was there – and there was an increase in the amount of information that gets produced about something. Is it moving faster thanks to roads, steam, radio, whatever? Um, is there is there changes? Are there changes in the control of that system? Like who's controlling it? Are there rules and laws? Are there people who own certain things? Like are there fluctuations that are happening in the controls of that information ecosystem? And the answer is that in all of those cases, there were to some degree that, um, an acceleration at least of these things um, after new technology changes how we process and share information. And then there tended to be these two communities. So there'd be a new idea that would emerge, like democracy in ancient Greece, um, that would come into conflict with pre-existing ideas of oligarchy. And uh, as one idea starts to push, the other one starts to fight against it. And you enter into this kind of information competition that can escalate. Um, now, my case studies were the Peloponnesian War, the English Civil War, um, the American Civil War, Vietnam, and the fight for independence, and the Ukraine conflict in 2014. I'm curious if you have an instinct to, uh, to the question about the question of what the optimal level of mis- and disinformation are in an ecosystem. So it's tempting to say you want all the information to be true, but it's got to be wrong in the sense that an environment in which nobody is willing to say anything that's untrue is actually an environment in which people aren't taking risks, people aren't floating ideas that challenge accepted ones, people aren't doing – science in ways that produces wrong answers to things. Um, and so some degree of people being wrong is inherent to a healthy discourse. Um, and sometimes the people who are wrong are going to be very persuasive and very loud, and it will sound like mis- or disinformation, whereas it's really just people being wrong. Uh, which, of course, can be mis- or disinformation. And so I'm, I'm wondering when we – in the environmental context, we have this baseline understanding of what a healthy ecosystem is, which is loosely defined as an ecosystem that we haven't fucked up. <laughs> and um, what is a healthy information ecosystem looks, look like and how much – garbage information does it contain? You have tried to get me to answer this question so many times, and I it's like the billion-dollar question right now um, because that's what we need to understand for democracies and I think for democracies to persist at this point. Um, I think there's always going to be a level of information pollution. It's just a byproduct of humanity. Right. The question is, how much do we let it go completely unchecked? What are the levers for actually doing something about it? It's probably not after you've had an oil spill. That's not optimal. Right. You want to figure out what it is that's causing this stuff in the first place so that you can work to prevent it. And if, if it's a matter of where it's being caused kind of downstream, then maybe you could figure out what the levers are. But right now we're not. We're just trying to stem it as it's like emerging. Um, so I think there's always going to be that as a byproduct. There's like rumors. There's, you know, people will make up lies. People will try to come up with answers to things when there's no information available. We know that this gets worse in the middle of things like conflicts and um, emergencies and crises like a pandemic um, or like any kind of natural disaster that's happening. 
Um, and clearly, it also seems to get worse around elections, which raises a lot of questions about the state of our politics more than anything. Um, and so then the question is, like, what? where are your points of control? Like, why aren't we talking about some sort of code of ethics that politicians should sign on to? Can't we pressure them as democracies? Like, we have a vote, we have citizens, but we seem to be very quick to go into our own camps and and not see that there is any power of the people to do anything. I feel like we're not really looking at this again like a system. We're just looking at this um, in terms of camps. I think that there's also going to be a degree of people not getting along, right? Not everybody's going to have the same point of view all the time. Um, and so th I think the balance for democracy is our ability to compromise, right? So how do we come to a conclusion that's maybe not the best thing, but mutually agreeable to both sides on some topics. I think that, unfortunately, in the current state of affairs, we've probably gone past that as a possibility. We should have been looking at prepping ourselves for this probably after the introduction of cable television. All right. So leaving aside the is it too late? Are we in a, <laughs> we in a information super fun site now? Um, I, I'm hung up on this question of what a healthy ecosystem looks like because if we can't define that, it seems like the question of whether an ecosystem is getting more or less healthy becomes very hard to to address, very hard to define, and the the whole ecological metaphor or environmental metaphor kind of pivots on the idea that we have a definition of a healthy environment or we have an understanding of a healthy environment. And so I'm wondering what, why does the whole, the whole theory not fall apart if you can't define uh, you know, what a pristine Amazon looks like. But we've had hundreds of years to build up information in biology and ecology to understand the physical world. We haven't been doing that in the information environment. Like, we're starting with nothing, essentially, but some ideas that we might have, like freedom of speech, et cetera. And that's mostly in the context of democracy. So we don't have the underpinning foundation to even be able to, to, to say that. There are some things that we could probably guess at if we were going to take democratic values as a starting point. So could, could I venture the, I think, reasonable hypothesis that having news outlets devoted not to telling the truth but to promoting partisan positions irrespective of their truth is probably – unhealthy. I think that's likely very unhealthy. Yes. Yes. Having politicians who uh, espouse disinformation for their own gain just to win power is, is unhealthy. So we have actually a lot of hypotheses about the pollutant, about the toxic pollutants, right? We're not, we're not completely without information about ecosystem health here. I think there are definitely some things that would be starting points to look at. Um, I mean, I'm very concerned about who controls who controls media in general. Um, and I, <laughs> I'm sure that this will just easily be attacked, especially in this country, because you're not able to have that kind of conversation. Um, but if we're concerned about businesses owning digital media platforms, why are we not equally concerned about businesses owning media? Both of these things have the potential to be informing people. And if the legitimacy of democracy is based on free and informed opinion, decision making, um, then any major place that is informing citizens should be protected uh, in some way. Right. Whether it's that you're protecting the people that work at them so that they can be independent to make decisions that are ethical if they come up across an editorial board or an owner that disagrees with them. Um, but also there should be, I, I think it's more around ethical principles that should guide 
who can own and control and what they can do rather than regulating them and telling them what to do. I think we're back at this stage. It's like basic kind of like principles. The tectonic principles. Yeah, of, exactly. Uh, to, to use a different metaphor. I do suspect that there's other places where we can borrow from. I mean, you have heard this word being used a lot, information integrity, that's coming from the information security field. Um, I think that it's been mostly applied to closed and controlled systems, which is not easily applicable to the wider information environment, but maybe we can adopt adapt the terminology to work for that. And that's like maybe it's basic things like consistency, having access to information, being able to stay online, um, issues around censorship. It could also be about reliability. So having the same results, suitable news sources, sustainability for them and independence and transparency of them could be accuracy, the quality of being correct. Um, so you, there is an aspect of, of needing, I think, fact-checking. Um, but fidelity, the degree to which people are actually able to understand the message as it had been originally intended, right? Because you can have all the access, uh, the accuracy, you know, reliability and consistency that you want, but if the audience already doesn't believe what you're giving them, um, you've lost that as well. And I think that there's an aspect of safety that is maybe not well understood outside of the people who are experiencing very unsafe environments. Um, but this comes back to, I think that there are fundamental principles that we agree on democracy, like that media is supposed to be f free, like independent, that media journalists should be able to cover stories and not be fearing for their life or be thrown in jail. At the same time, we have environments here in Canada and the U.S. where journalists are being attacked and harassed at alarming rates, right? We're not living by those principles ourselves anymore here. Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, could you create um, a study that says, all right, let's take these eight or ten benchmarks of media ecosystem health, not the truth of the information being purveyed, but our how many journalists are killed a year per capita, right? How many... Uh, attacks, how many, you know, our media organizations, uh, 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 you know, uh, diversely held uh, in ownership terms, et cetera, et cetera. And you measure that against the degree of public trust in media system, in, in, in the media environment. And you see, do, do places where the media is diversely owned, where journalists are reasonably protected, where the party in power doesn't control state-owned media, are also places where you have high degree of public trust in, in media. So this would be amazing things to study. And I think that there's a wealth of data that already exists. We're often very focused on um, social media data, and rightly so. Like, it's not well understood what it does to the wider information environment. And so we do need, researchers do need more access to that and better understanding. But there's also all of these wonderful data sets that places like the UN, UNDP, World Bank have been aggregating over time. Things like literacy rates. Um, we can measure things like access, like how are people accessing? What kind of technology are they using? How fast is it coming? Um, the trust studies are a little more challenging. It can be a bit, a bit difficult to really get at the root of trust in measuring that. But I think that um, that's what we have to marry. Like we have to marry different studies that, that look at people's perspectives, um, what they think about different issues perhaps, but also their behavior. Like so are they going out and voting? Is voting declining over time? Um, what other kinds of activities can we look at that would indicate whether people feel engaged in democracies anymore? Um, and I think that if we were to take those and, and whittle it down to the, the best indicators, we could probably find out ways that we could study and compare ecosystems, information ecosystems. Um, it's more a matter of time. So there is another sense, I think, in which the comparison – is uh, both alluring and daunting and frustrating. And that is the, the fact that as you study climate and weather and sort of ecosystem ecosystems, one is the 
um, one thing that jumps out at you is that the number of variables in it's the sort of ultimate multivariate equation, right? And another is, but boy, that there are these certain variables that just have incredibly outsized effects on everything. Like if you dump a whole lot of carbon into the atmosphere, the temperature goes up. And that's actually one variable. It's just a variable that has just super, super, super high salience to the outcome of, of all kinds of metrics. And so I guess my question is you're describing another mu huge multivariable equation uh, and you're saying don't try to evaluate the, you know, the, uh, the equation until you – until you know a lot more about a lot more of the variables and coefficients than we do work with hypotheses for now. Do you imagine that when we understand this as well as we understand climate and weather uh, and, uh, and ecosystems that there'll be something like carbon that boy, you're dumping a lot of CO2 into this information ecosystem and you can stop that by, you know, doing X or by doing X combination of things um, and that a, a huge amount of stuff boils down to a very small number of variables, which is oversimplifying, of course, the climate equation. But, um, but it's also true is there is your working hypothesis that there's something similar here, or is it ultimately that you have a 300 variable expression, each with a coefficient, and you've got to understand each of those little as separate knobs? No, I think I I suspect that there will be key areas of where interventions make the most sense. So. We, after five case studies of new technology changing things, right, one thing that stands out to me is that within a generation, at least you're, you're probably going to have some sort of information competition happen. It just naturally arises. So if you've got a new technology that comes in like, I don't know, AI right now, then maybe now is the time to be investing in education. And I'm talking more of like the critical thinking kind, right? So just t telling people – um, more about what kind of world they're living in, how information is manipulated, how it's put in front of them. Um, also, maybe basic thinking skills like we have a problem with risk. Humans suck at it. Like we know that this is a deficiency. Why aren't we teaching kids in school to be prepared for the fact that they're going to make really poor decisions because they don't understand risk? Even if they don't get smart enough that they can, you know, really calculate the risk better, at least maybe they'll be aware that this is a faulty thing so that they can check how they go about getting information or what their response and reaction is to it. Um, so I would say that, like, right there, we know that once a new technology changes things, really that's the point where we massively need to invest in education and preparing people for what's going to come, preparing people for the manipulation that's probably going to happen as two camps engage in an information competition to win hearts and minds of the community and dominate over each other. Um, I think that there's probably other ways that, uh, that, that we can probably intervene as well. I also think that there's other factors that shape people and their response, like the economy. Right. There's other variables that we may not be able to control. But again, if we see that something's coming, then maybe we can pair that with the types of information that are going to be needed to get people through hard times. Some sort of systemic channeling to ensure that they are taken care of, that they have the skills and ability to be able to respond. Um, that's what I'm looking towards. All right. This is the part of chatter where we reach into the chatter box and we pull out a random question. So here, here we go. Should the United States send a manned mission to Mars? If they never want to come back, I guess. So if we were to send a manned mission to Mars, what would be 
the disinformation and conspiracy theories that would arise around it. Oh, this is such a great point because I didn't raise this. The fact is that we just rehash the same patterns of disinformation over and over again, like vaccines throughout time. We could have been totally prepped for this. We should have been prepped for the pandemic, for example. The first thing is going to be that they never got there. It never happened. It's never all staged. Left. It's, all, yeah, yeah, exactly. it's all in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. because yeah. uh, And they used the same set as they used for the moon. Well, Alicia Wanless, I would close by saying that you're a great American, except that you're a great Canadian. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us on Chatter. Thank you for having me, Ben. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. 